So today we're starting a brand new program, Adobe Illustrator. So we're going to launch Illustrator, and while it's launching, let's talk a little bit about why we use Illustrator instead of Photoshop. If we zoom in on a Photoshop image, and we keep zooming in, eventually what you'll see is that this entire image is comprised of little squares. This is what's referred to as a bitmap file. The entire image is composed of a color assigned to a particular position on a grid. Illustrator, on the other hand, allows you to create graphics that are called resolution independent. And that means that unlike Photoshop, which relies on little squares of color in a particular position to describe an image, Illustrator uses math. Now the nice thing is, you don't have to do the math, the program does the math for you. We use Illustrator when we need to create graphics that need to run in a variety of sizes. If we were just using Photoshop for something like this, then we'd always have to start off with an absolutely enormous size in case the graphic or artwork we're creating needed to run really large. But in a program like Illustrator, I can create my graphic pretty much any size and I can always ask it to be bigger or smaller depending upon the requirements. Because it's not relying on resolution, those tiny squares of color, it's relying on math, it's easy to scale them up or down. So this is the perfect venue for things like logo design. So now that Illustrator's opened up, you can see that I've been doing quite a bit of work in Illustrator, and all these little thumbnails represent recent documents. We're going to start off with a brand new file, so we're going to go to File, New. When you open up the new dialog box, you'll notice that along the top, you have things like mobile, web, print, and these represent a collection of default sizes for working in these different media types. Today is meant to be a very basic orientation, so we're going to click onto the print collection. We're going to select letter as our default size. And over here on the right hand side, notice that we have the opportunity to name this file. So I'm going to name it with my last name, first initial, underscore, and I'm just going to call this Intro Illustrator. I'm going to change the orientation of the document so that it's landscape. And notice that we have a width value and a height value, and we can change the unit of measure, just like we could in Photoshop. But one area that we won't have is we won't have an area for resolution. Because again, Illustrator is a resolution independent program. Once we have the correct size and the correct orientation, and you've named your file. We're going to click Create. And the next thing we're going to do to make sure that everyone's seen the same collection of tools in the same places as they appear in this video is very similar to Photoshop. We're going to go to Window, Workspace, and we are going to select Essentials. And then we're going to go back to Window, Workspace, and I'm going to select Reset Essentials and that just collects all those different palettes and tools in these default positions. Now that we have our workspace set up, we're going to take a look at the tool palette, and I'm just going to drag it over here so it's closer to our drawing area. When we're working in Illustrator, we tend to start off by working with basic shapes and objects that we create. So over here in our tool palette, we're going to start off by working with simple shapes, and you'll notice that most of the tools in our tool palette have that little triangle in the lower right hand corner which means that we can click and hold and we have other options available. So we're going to start off with the ellipse tool and the ellipse tool allows you to create ovals and it also allows you to create circles. When you want to create a circle just like in Photoshop when we're using the elliptical marquee tool we're going to hold our shift key and click and drag and I always want to let go of my mouse first before I let go of my shift key. And now I have a circle. I'm going to stop for a moment and select my selection tool. And I use my selection tool when I want to make global changes to something that I've created. So I want to click on it and move it and reposition it. I can also use my nudge keys, my up, down, right, left nudge keys when I'm trying to very precisely position something. And just like Photoshop, if I have something selected and I wanted to move it in larger increments with my nudge key, I can use my shift key and it moves it in larger increments. When we create objects or shapes in Illustrator, they always have the potential to have two attributes. Over here in the tool palette, I can see that this selected shape 
has two attributes. It has a fill, which is white, and it has a stroke, which is black. We can make some changes to these attributes using the bottom of the tool palette, but what we should do is get used to using the properties panel. And I'm going to click and drag and move this closer to our drawing area and reposition the circle so it's easier to see what's going on. What shows up in the properties panel will depend on what is selected. So when I don't have anything selected, I get properties that are related to the document. When I have an object selected, I have properties that are related to the type of object it is. If it was type, it would show something different, but right now I have a simple circle and I've got the appearance area, which again, tells me that my fill is white and my stroke is black. If I want to change the color of my fill, I can click right on that little color chip and choose from one of these default colors. So we're going to start off by making it bright magenta on the inside. And I'm going to change my stroke by clicking on that little color chip that represents the stroke color. And I'm going to make it green. And if I click off to the side, I can view this object without all those little selection elements clouding my view of what's going on. I'm going to click to select it again. And this time I'm going to modify not just the stroke color, but the thickness of the stroke. And as usual, we have a little pull down palette so I can make a change by selecting a new value from there. Or just like in Photoshop, usually if there was a numeric field, I could click inside it so I see my cursor moving and then again, use my nudge keys to change those values. And our shift trick works the same with the shift key held down it moves it in much larger increments. So now you already know how to edit two of the basic attributes of an object. Before we move on, I want you to also know that sometimes you want a shape with a fill color, but no stroke at all. So in order to remove the stroke, I'm going to click on the stroke icon with that object selected and ask for no stroke. So now I have an object that only has the fill attribute applied. I'm going to re-enable the stroke, selecting the green color and taking it up to 12 point and take a look at the fill. If I click on the fill icon, I also have the option to ask for no fill. So I have an object that's empty in the center or transparent and just has that stroke applied to it. So before we move on, make sure that you have a fairly large circle and I would like you to apply a pink fill to it and a stroke that's about 12 point and a nice contrasting green color. And now we're going to create another circle. And you'll notice that when I select my ellipse tool, those two attributes I just applied to this circle are still selected. So the moment I create this new circle, it's automatically going to have those two attributes applied to it. And we're going to change those. So we're going to go over to our properties panel. And we're going to change the fill color to an orange and the stroke color to a blue. And I'm going to increase the size of the stroke applied to the second circle. So it's about 33 points. Now, depending upon how big your circle is, 33 points might be too much. So use a value that makes sense for the size of shape that you have. So now we have two separate objects and I can reselect this object at any time and I can resize and reposition this object at any time. Whenever you see the selection handles or the corners, you're basically dealing with exactly what we had in Photoshop when we enabled transformation. So if I want to scale the circle up and make sure it stays a circle, I'm holding my shift key, I'm clicking on a corner and dragging, always letting go of the mouse first and then the shift key. In Photoshop, when we were working with multiple elements, we wanted to keep them editable. We had to be very careful to put things on different layers. Here in Illustrator, you can use layers to divide up more complicated drawings. But in Illustrator, because we're working with objects, each time you create an object, for all intents and purposes, it is sort of on its own little layer. And I'll show you what I mean. I'm going to move this smaller circle so it's overlapping that larger circle that I created. And I can deselect it and I can select it again, move it around. And it's still fully editable, even though both of these objects are on the same layer. One important thing to notice is that the first object I created is underneath 
the second object. And if I add one more circle, and I'm going to intentionally draw it so it overlaps both of these previous objects, and I'm going to change the fill to yellow, and I'm going to change the stroke to purple, and reselect my selection tool, and deselect. You can see that the first object is underneath, the second object is on top of that, and the third one is on top of that. This is referred to as a stacking order. What's important to understand is that I can rearrange the order these objects appear in. I'm going to select the last circle that I created that's sitting on top of the other two shapes, and I'm going to go to the Object menu, and I'm going to go to Arrange, Ignore, Bring Forward, and Bring Backward. Instead, just focus on Send to Back and Bring to Front. So right now, the object I have selected is on top of all the others, so I'm going to select Send to Back. And if I zoom out, you'll see that that selected object was sent behind all the other objects on this layer. And of course, I can rearrange it back to the front by selecting it, going to Object, Arrange, and Bring to Front. Another thing I can do is I can select more than one object at a time. So I'm clicking on my large circle, holding my Shift key, and clicking on a second circle, and now both of these objects are selected, and I can go to Object Arrange and send both of them to the back at the same time. The two selected circles maintain their position relative to one another, but they both travel back underneath whatever other objects are on that layer. One more helpful thing to know is that I can select more than one thing at a time and move them both at the same time and reposition them. Another thing I can also do is I can group objects together. And when I group objects together, they both remain separate objects, but they simply act for the purpose of selection, moving, and scaling like one object. So I'm going to reselect my large circle, hold my shift key, select my second circle, and then I'm going to the object menu to select group. And notice there's a key command for this, and I would really encourage you to memorize it because you're going to probably be using it quite a bit. So I'm going to select group, and my document doesn't look any different than it did before, but if I deselect and then click on either one of these circles, both become selected because they're grouped together. I can hold my shift key, click on a corner handle, and they both scale at the same time, move at the same time, and if I wanted to, rotate at the same time as well. There's one last thing I want to cover, and that is when I have objects that are grouped together, I might want to edit the size, position, or the attributes of one of those grouped objects. Now I have two choices. I can click on the group, and both of those objects are selected, and I can go to Object, Ungroup, click off to the side, click on the object that I want to change, and let's make a change. Let's fill this in with orange. And then after I've made that change, if I still want these two circles to be grouped together, I can click on one, hold my shift key, click on the second one, go back to object group or command G, and now I'm back to manipulating my document. A faster way of achieving the same goal is when I have a group and I want to select one of the objects, I can double click on that object, and now you'll notice that this circle looks like it isn't grouped anymore. But in fact, what I've done by double clicking on something from a group is, is I've toggled into this special editing mode. It's called an isolation mode, which allows me to select and manipulate an object that's part of a larger group. And notice up here, it's letting me know that I have an object that's part of a group that's selected. So I can go ahead and reposition change one of the attributes like the stroke color or the fill color. And when I'm done editing that object and I want to get out of this isolation mode, I can double click on my document area and everything's back to normal. These two objects are still grouped together and that's just a much faster way of editing an item that's in a group.
So now you have sort of a basic introduction to working with a vector-based application and just getting used to this idea of objects already being essentially on their own layer, being able to edit the basic attributes of an object, the fill and the stroke, changing the order that the objects are in by going to object, arrange, bring to front, or send to back, and also grouping objects and editing an element in the group.